Hi everybody, Rob Ager here. I've got two videos that I want to try and get done today. I've got about a three hour window of time to try and record these two videos. I might only get one done. Um, but something that struck me a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is, this is something I don't normally don't do. Uh, I posted a, a clip of an interview that I was in for another channel a few weeks ago and it got way more views than my videos normally get in the first month. And um, basically the video was just me giving a, a simple summation of uh, my interpretation of 2001 A Space Odyssey and uh, how the film was produced and why it was made and why Kubrick made it and all that kind of stuff. And normally I don't um, put out videos which is just me giving an interpretation of a movie just waffling to the camera like this, like a standard um, off-the-cuff film review. I don't normally do that. Typically, I like to put out um, very detailed studies that are very carefully worded so that I can make sure that I articulate things exactly the way I want to say them because sometimes when you're doing things off the cuff, you don't manage to use the right words and then people say, oh, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense or you haven't provided evidence or something like that. Um, but yeah, that video showed that there is... Um, uh, th there's an audience uh, for me doing it in a, in a more off-the-cuff way. So that's what I'm going to do here. Um, I've got two Kubrick-related uh, videos that I was intending to take my time on um, writing and editing, um, but I'm just going to take the notes that I've done and I'm going to do them as presentations and I'll probably edit in some little bits and pieces of footage from the movies afterwards uh, and hope that the videos don't get blocked for that. Um, okay, so the first one is the movie... AI artificial intelligence and the vast majority of people who I speak to and when I look at reviews online and when I look at clips of the movie in the comment sections on YouTube it seems that the vast majority of people just go oh that's a soppy uh, Spielberg movie um, it's got a soppy ending it's over sentimental uh, that seems to be the prevailing interpretation of that movie and that, that people can't see past that um, I, I think it's a real shame uh, because there's so much that that movie has got to offer. And I am recommending if you haven't seen it, you must go and watch this movie. It's so unusual, so unique, and it's so multi-layered. If you have seen it before, and even if you hated it, you know, just go and re-watch it. Uh, because I'm going to give you lots and lots of material to think about here, about other things that are going on in that movie uh, that actually make it a lot more dark than people think it is. But first of all... The, the preconceptions about Spielberg is an important thing to address. <clears throat> People just seem to have this thing where, oh, Spielberg just does sentimental, wish-washy, dreamy um, stuff for kids, and, and that's it. That's all Spielberg is. That's A lot of people interpret it that way. But <clears throat> the primary movie that gives that interpretation of um, Spielberg is the movie E.T., you know, it was a huge, huge hit at the time. It was very sentimental for the kids and so on. But E.T. is incredibly deep. There's loads of um, hidden themes going on in that movie. It's a very personal movie of Spielberg's. It's got a lot of metaphors, a lot of subtext, tons of stuff. It works brilliantly for the kids. But if you actually carefully study the film, especially study all the details, it's got a lot of um, depth to it. It's brilliant. However... Spielberg is capable of doing much darker material, and he already has done it. I mean, he did Saving Private Ryan. That was very uh, brutal uh, representation of um, the battlefields. You know, at the time when it came out, that movie shocked a lot of people at how violent it was. But even re uh, before E.T., Spielberg made Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, and that was like a kid's adventure movie. Well, but adults loved it as well. But it was incredibly dark and brutal. It had people getting their faces melted off uh, by when the arc gets opened, Nazis having their faces melted. Nice um, sort of metaphor of the reversal of, um, you know, the, the, the burning of the Jews. You know, Spielberg threw that in the, the, um, into the movie, uh, him and Lucas, I think they conceived that between them. Um, so you had a reversal where it's, where it's the Nazis who get burned. Um, so that was a dark aspect of that movie, and the violence was very savage in that movie. I mean, it was way more brutal than most James Bond movies are. Um, even the modern James Bond movies, which aren't very good because they're too serious, even they, um, I think the original Indiana Jones movies are just as brutal as uh, the modern James Bond movies in terms of violence. 
<clears throat> and then Spielberg had also um, ghost directed uh, Poltergeist. <laughs> How ironic! He ghost directed Poltergeist, which is a post uh, a ghost movie. Um, and yeah, he did a fantastic job on that. And that that movie combines the, the the sort of family sentimentality of Spielberg, but it also shows all the dark stuff. Remember that brilliant scene where the guy, uh, the scientist, looks in the mirror, and he's just he's just had a vision of a steak crawling across the the kitchen on its own, and um, he's freaked out, so he runs to a mirror in the bathroom. And then he, he sees all these like pock marks in his face and he starts pulling at them. And then he pulls all his, the skin off his face and he sees his own skull um, or the skull of a ghost that is um, haunting the house. And then there's a flash and then his face is back to normal. Terrifying scene, uh, scene. Terrifying scene. When you first see that movie for the first time, it's like, oh my God. And you think the guy is actually pulling his face off and it, the film has gone to a level of physical gruesomeness. Um, that you didn't think it was going to go to, and then it flashes and, and his face is okay. Uh, but Spielberg directed that, and not only did he direct the film, and there's plenty of evidence that he did actually direct it, and Toby Hooper was there on set, but Spielberg was calling the shots. Um, not only did he direct the film, but those are actually his hands that are pulling the, the flesh off the face. That's Spielberg pulling the, that face off to reveal the skull underneath. So this idea that Spielberg is just some soppy um, kids movie maker, no, no, the guy can do much darker stuff and he can also do incredibly intelligent stuff. And he has especially done it with AI, artificial intelligence. And then you have Kubrick's involvement, okay? So the script for AI, the, the basic story, uh, was pretty much put together um, by Stanley Kubrick. Over the course of at least 20 years, he was working on this. He'd got hold of a, a sci-fi story called Super Toys Last All Summer Long. I think it was by Brian Aldiss. I can't remember the detail off the top of my head, but um, it's not important to remember it because um, I went and read that short story and it bears very little resemblance to the movie. It covers maybe 5%, 10% of what's in the movie. The movie goes off on all kinds of other tangents. And that's exactly what happened uh, when Kubrick did 2001 A Space Odyssey. It bore very little resemblance to, to the original short story or short stories um, that um, Arthur C. Clarke had done. So... Kubrick spends 20 years working on this project. You know, he's making other movies. He's making things like Eyes Wide Shut and Full Metal Jacket. <clears throat> but meanwhile, on the side, he's working on AI artificial intelligence. Now, this is important to note because a lot of people interpret the movie AI on very, very simple levels. In fact, they tend to uh, perceive most movies on very simple levels. People like to be able to sum up a movie in a single sentence. So one of the ones that gets said about uh, the AI movie is, oh, it's, that's just a retelling of Pinocchio. Well, it is a little bit of a retelling of Pinocchio, but it's certainly not the only way of interpreting it. It's not even the foremost way of interpreting it. I would say it's one of the most obvious ones that you don't even have to think about to notice. There are so many references to Pinocchio in the film, and they're, they're made verbally as well. So yeah, you get the Pinocchio interpretation, you get the kiddie wish fulfillment interpretation, uh, just Spielberg is just being soppy. So because people have those interpretations, uh, one of them or both of them, they stop looking at the movie and they don't bother re-watching it and reconsidering it. But consider the fact that uh, Kubrick spent over two decades working on the basic concept of this film. Uh, he worked with multiple different sci-fi writers and they didn't know about each other working on it. He'd, he'd He'd pick one sci-fi writer, he'd work with them for maybe a year or two, he'd gather all the material he got from that um, sort of brainstorming session and the various uh, script treatments that they'd put together. Then he would finish with that writer, he'd hook up with another famous sci-fi writer and do the exact same with them. But each of the different sci-fi writers was contracted where they couldn't reveal their involvement. So they each of them didn't know that the others had been working on this, um, this uh, movie concept. Uh, only Kubrick seemed to know that and maybe his close family. <clears throat> so, you don't spend over two decades putting together the concept of a movie if all it is is just a retelling of Pinocchio or it's only going to be 
some soppy kids wish fulfillment thing. No, you don't spend a couple of decades doing that. Um, Kubrick was trying to put together like what he normally does with his movies, or what, at least what he did in his Lolita and post Lolita movies. He was trying to put together one of those Rubik's Cube type movies that has multiple sides to it, um, that have some overlap with each other, and where, but you also get narrative elements that are distinctly separate so that you can interpret the film as that, but at the same time, you can ignore that and go, oh, well, the film's about this. So it's almost like he's making multiple movies in one. He wants his, his movie to, to have such a rewatch level uh, that you can watch it multiple times, and it's like you're watching a different movie each time. <clears throat> and the movie definitely has that. Um, and there are published storyboards for the movie AI, which uh, reveal a hell of a lot more as well. There's a huge book, which I've got in the other room, and um, the book is, uh, it's some of the concept artwork that Kubrick put together with a, an artist, I think his name was Chris Baker, um, they put all this material together, basically storyboarded the majority of the movie. Um, and after Kubrick died, <clears throat> all of those storyboards, plus an 80-page script treatment, were handed to Spielberg. And then Spielberg set out to sort of develop the project further, um, flesh out the script a bit more. And I've got no doubt that he was liaising with um, Jan Harlan and, and perhaps Christian Kubrick, um, Jan Harlan had been producing a lot of Kubrick's movies when he was alive, and um, Christian Kubrick as well. I mean, you know, she, I'm, I'm sure Kubrick, being married to her, used to run a lot of his material by her and get her opinion, you know, and get her input. So with, with those two still being alive and the project being um, contractually handed over to Steven Spielberg, I've no doubt that Spielberg liaised with them to make sure that the... Uh, the final script that was put together was fully reflective of what Kubrick wanted in terms of themes uh, and so on. And another very important thing is that the people who complain about the soppy ending, uh, where the kid gets the mother love wish fulfillment that he wants through the most extraordinary, unbelievable circumstances. Um, <laughs> it's a funny one, but a lot of people think, oh, that's just Spielberg doing what Spielberg does. But no, uh, Kubrick already had that ending conceived in advance. And Kubrick wanted Spielberg to direct the film, by the way. He had been asking them for a long time before he died, you know, would you want to direct this because it's more um, your style of uh, direction? And he knew that Spielberg would would, would do a better job of uh, presenting the, um, you know, the, the kids' wish fulfillment elements of the film because, you know, Spielberg is really good at that. So the fact that Kubrick was actually wanting somebody else to direct a movie that he conceived that shows how much respect and trust he had for Spielberg oh, but also um <laughs> I I consider AI to be an incredibly dark movie uh, despite the the soppy ending there's a lot of dark stuff um throughout the movie incredibly dark that's easy to miss um incredibly dark themes and there's there are extremely dark elements to the ending as well uh, and there's one way of interpreting the ending which completely reverses the soppiness of it um and reveals it to be something else and I'll talk about that a little bit later <clears throat> so i'm i'm going to go over some basic things here i've got some notes about uh, ways that you can interpret this movie i will be mentioning some details from the film but on the whole i'm going to give you basic concepts uh, that you can go back and look at the movie and consider in a rewatch, or hopefully in a few rewatches. Right, so one frequent element is um, there's a scene in the movie where um, David, the robot boy, the artificial boy character, um, he is not yet um, imprinted on uh, the human mother. He's not yet been programmed to have the undying love for her that, that he ends up having for the rest of the movie. And um, she sits and she reads out some instructions for, you know, a programming sheet um, that will make him imprint her face in his mind and uh, it will make him have this undying love. <clears throat> and when she does the imprinting, she, she puts her fingers on the back of his neck. She has, that's part of the programming, she has to touch the back of his neck um, with, a fing with all four fingers, uh, just the back of the skull, and then she has to uh, say these words, uh, which are the imprinting protocol. 
and uh, and then instantly David is programmed to th make him absolutely adore her and he can't even switch off the love even if he wants to. Now that concept of um, one character imprinting on another, programming another, that pops up at different points in the movie in different formats. Um, the the harrowing scene where the mother, you know, she's decided she has to get rid of this robot boy because she considers him to be a physical threat to the family. And she hasn't got the heart to take him to the Cybertronics organization to have him actually destroyed because um, she's sort of imprinted on him as well. You know, uh, the programming was supposed to make him love her, but it's also made her sort of love him a little bit. And she's having problems with that. So she decides to just let him go in the forest and abandon him uh, in the hope that he can somehow make a life for himself. And when the boy starts crying and he's like, please don't leave me here in the forest. I, I promise I'll become a real boy. And all It's a really harrowing scene because the acting from uh, Haley Joel Osment is absolutely brilliant. I remember watching the movie in the cinema and that scene, my eyes were welling up. His acting was so convincing. And the situation was so harrowing. Um, but he grabs the mother. Um, he's trying to cling on to it. And he puts both his hands with the fingers right round the back of her neck as he is crying and crying to her. And he's causing her mass massive emotional turmoil. He's trying to imprint upon her with the fingers at the back of the neck. So that's one example. And then you get a follow-up scene where um, the, the robot character Gigolo Joe is introduced and he is seducing a human woman. You know, he's a sex lover robot. And he, he, he goes through a programming process with her. He's standing there and he's talking to her and he's saying all of these magic words, just like when David was programmed by the mother, um, to make the girl drop her, all her emotional defenses and to feel emotional attachment to him, even though he's just a machine. And... Um, as part of doing that, he puts his fingers at the back of the neck, of her neck, and he looks into her eyes, and he, he's saying, I think he's saying something like, you are a goddess, um, you deserve more than you've been getting, uh, you deserve me, and all that kind of stuff. And he's basically telling her all the stuff uh, that she needs to hear in order for him to imprint himself on her so there's an attachment. So that's something to look out for in the movie. There's various instances of this fingers on the back of the neck, um, robots imprinting upon people, people imprinting upon robots and so on. There's back and forth imprinting is going on. Another thing to look out for in this movie, very important, is that on the surface level, the movie appears to be about the rights of robots, the idea that as um, computers, uh, robots, uh, so-called artificial intelligence or fake intelligence, which I prefer to call it because that's what it is, um, as these things become more complex and more advanced, and they gradually become more able to trick our basic human perception, um, that at some point in the future, uh, there might be some uh, time when, you know, the people get this idea that the, the robots and the machines actually have human thoughts and human feelings or equivalent, and therefore should have human rights. I think the movie was probably a bit too ahead of its time when it came out for that to be the case. <clears throat> But as time goes on, you know, we are seeing more and more of these uh, advanced robotics where, you know, we're seeing video clips from these companies that are making robots that, that have got like, um, you know, much more enhanced physical maneuverability. And we're getting these chatbot programs and stuff, which I personally don't find very impressive, uh, but a lot of people seem to be fooled by it. Um, but, you know, the, the, the programming code behind a lot of these chatbots tends to be kept secret. Um, uh, may, probably the main reason being uh, that they don't want the competition to copy the elements of that code. But as a result of that, because people don't understand the coding process that is behind the chatbot, um, they, they perceive that there's a sort of magical mind going on there and they think, oh my God, robots are actually becoming intelligent. They're not, they're just programs, you know? It's what they always have been. And as far as I can tell, that's what they always will be. Um, they are machines, they are dead, they have no um, actual um, self-motivation, um, they only do what they are programmed to do, they never do anything more. I mean, you can 
write a program and you can add in lots and lots of complex variables so that the computer might randomly go off and do this or randomly go off and do that. Or you might accidentally program a sequence into a, um, a computer that ends up doing something that you didn't think it was going to do. Now, a layman could easily look at that and go, oh, well, that's because the computer has a mind of its own. No, the computer is still only doing what it was programmed to do. It's just that the programmer might have made a mistake in how they coded it and may have accidentally made the, the computer do something that the programmer didn't consciously realize it was going to do. Um, that does not make the computer alive. It doesn't make the program alive. It's still just automation of code. And so what we call artificial intelligence the only intelligence that is actually there in a computer program or a computer is the intelligence of the humans who physically designed uh, the computer or robot or machine and the intelligence of the programmers, the human programmers who wrote the programs. That's the intelligent part. The rest is just automation. It's uh, mechanical, automa uh, mechanical automation and it is coding aut automation. But the computers, the, the robots, they never ever... Um, decide of their own will because they haven't got a will to do anything else. So I consider that to be the reality of computers and artificial intelligence or fake intelligence. Um, now this movie puts across the opposite idea of that and I don't think Kubrick actually believed that because as I've talked about before in 2001 A Space Odyssey Kubrick massively mocked artificial intelligence. He had this HAL 9,000 robot um, computer in the movie, not, not so much a physical robot, but an, a so-called artificial intelligence. And, you know, he planted all kinds of stuff in the movie to show that, you know, that this intelligence is, it's fake um, and it could even be a threat. And, you know, he had the, the computer uh, lying in chess, in chess moves. He had the computer murdering people he dropped all kinds of clues in the movie um, that, that Hal basically represents IBM because IBM was at the forefront of trying to create artificial intelligence at the time. Uh, might, might still be, actually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't really see that Kubrick would have changed his tune on that and decided, oh, you're, you know what, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, human level uh, um, equivalent, um, robotic intelligence. Um, I don't see why Kubrick would have decided that it's coming and it's a good thing. Um, and yet the movie on its surface narrative appears to support that. Um, but what I started noticing in the movie, um, which I think is quite blatant when you really think about it, is that <clears throat> the, the robots in the movie, if you actually pay attention to their behavior, they don't have self-autonomy. They don't have proper self-awareness. Um, I would say the thing that makes a person human is the ability to uh, recognize our programs. This is, this is the core of our human intelligence and awareness, I believe. We are able to consider ourselves, to look at ourselves, to think about ourselves, and we're able to recognize our own behavioral programs and interfere and break those programs, Okay. So David in the movie, he gets programmed to have this undying love for his mother, right? Now, we also get programmed like that uh, in real life. You know, as a baby, we grow up with the parents. We're f very physically attached to the mother uh, because of the, the breast milk and the, the physical comfort and all that kind of stuff. And throughout childhood, um, you could say that we are imprinted with this absolute love and dependency on the mother or the father, you know, it can, it can happen with either parent um, or both. Um, but as we grow up, we, we learn to let go of that and become self-dependent. Um, self Nobody ever says to us, oh, it's time to end the program of parental love. But we, we teach ourselves, we learn how to let go of that program. Uh, to me, that's, that's what being human is, the ability to consider yourself, to consider your own automated biological reactions, and to go, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to intervene, intervene with that. Oh, this parent has been abusive to me, therefore I am going to withdraw my love and detach emotionally from them. But this David character in the movie, 
Um, even though the mother abandons him, she dumps him in the forest and abandons him. He should hate her after that. You know, um, at the very least, his love for her should be considerably reduced. But he is programmed to love her, and because he's a machine, he's a robot. Um, he can't do anything other than continue the program. Um, and this goes on throughout the movie um, in all kinds of ways. You've got Gigolo Joe. Uh, he was a sex robot. <clears throat> and his career as a sex robot is pretty much ended uh, because he's been uh, accused of a murder that he didn't do. And yet he continues to act like a gigolo throughout the movie. He keeps dancing around. Uh, he keeps trying to act like a playboy because that's his program. And there was a little scene where he's walking with David in the forest and he keeps doing these silly dances and stuff, which is part of his uh, seduction act with women. And um, the, the I, I call him the boy, It, the robot in the movie that we call David, asks him, why do you do that? You know, talking about the dances. And Gigolo Joe just says, oh, that's just what I do. Why do you do that? That's just what I do. Yeah, it's a program. Uh, these robots in the movie, are, they don't have actual minds. They're just ap operating on program loops. And despite the surface narrative, the movie is full of evidence to this effect. So yeah, definitely pay attention to that. Um, how the robots are unable to break out of their program loops. In fact, if I remember rightly, there was a scene where... <clears throat> Uh, David is, uh, he's, again, he's in the forest, he's trying to escape from capture, and he's with a bunch of other robots that are half destroyed, and some of them hide in a shed, and one of them is a nanny, um, and just as David has been programmed to love this specific human mother, um, he, he comes across a nanny robot in the movie who has the program that she must uh, love um, and care for a child. And so they come across each other, and it should be a, a, a sort of emotional marriage between them. You know, she offers to be his mother figure carer, and she even looks like the real mother human figure who David has been imprinted upon. Um, and she, she, she tries to uh, emotionally attach to him um, to become um, his carer figure. And I guess she's probably got a program where she doesn't have to care for a specific child. She just has to care for any child. So maybe she, her program has more flexibility. So David has found this robot who would make an ideal mother figure for him. And yet he can't, he can't return that offer of love. Do you need someone to take care of you? Would you like a nanny? Do you know where the blue fairy lives? He still has to go for the human mother who abandoned him. Um, so that you know, that's another example of that. But something really, really important about all that, I consider this a, a major aspect of the movie, uh, is that in the same way that the, the robot character David, it, I'm going to try and avoid calling it he, because it's not he. Um, it, it can't be male or female because it, it, it wasn't born with any... Uh, ability to uh, genetically reproduce. I mean, gender is to do with reproduction. That's the primary purpose of a gender. That's always been what it biologically is. Um, but he cannot reproduce, or it cannot reproduce. Therefore, David, it, um, is not a boy. It's not a he. It's an it. In the same way that the David robot fools the mother into thinking that he has the real emotions of a child, the character itself of David fools us, the audience, because you've got this brilliant young actor, uh, Haley Joel Osment, playing the role. Does a fantastic job. It's one of the greatest child acting performances of all time. And he gives such a great false act of making out that he's terrified of being uh, left and abandoned in the forest and he's emotionally devastated. Um, the actor gives such a great job of that that it doesn't just fool the mother, it fools us in the audience. I and mean, even thinking about it that way, I still find it hard to watch that scene and be emotionally uh, detached from it because, you know, his performance is so good. Um, so I think that's part of what the movie is demonstrating. Now, I'm pretty sure Kubrick knew about this um, and probably wanted it to happen. Uh, the movie is showing us how simulation of human emotion simulation of uh, a character 
uh, it occurs in, in movies through characters who are acted and scripted, um, but the, the characters aren't actually real. But we watch the movies and we are fooled into feeling uh, emotional attachment to those characters. In the same way that that happens for us, the audience, it's happening within the movie for the David character and the mother figure. The, the, the boy, the, the robot David, it, it's just a machine. That's all it is. It's just a toy. It, it keeps, he keeps getting called a toy throughout the movie, and that is actually true. Um, but she's been fooled by the act, just like we're fooled by the act. It's a nice little paradox in the movie, and I'm pretty sure that that was intended. And to that effect, there's a scene in the movie, uh, one of my favorite scenes, which is the flesh fair scene, uh, where um, organic humans gather and they celebrate organic life by destroying artificiality. They take these uh, robots, and which are not alive, and they destroy them on stage, uh, sort of like as a ritual to remind themselves and remind each other that, hey, we are human, and machines are not alive. They don't actually feel. Now, it's very clever the way this is done in the movie because it's presented as if they are the bad guys. The audience of humans are the bad guys uh, and that they are cruel and brutal and that they don't recognize that the, the robots are actually um, uh, basically alive, that they actually think and feel. The movie presents that narrative as an option for us to uh, think and feel. But I think underneath all that, I think Kubrick was telling us the truth. And so when you get the guy who's the leader at the flesh fair and, you know, he's talking about, um, he's telling the audience with a microphone, he's saying, look, look at this robot boy. He's not real. Uh, see how he tries to imitate our emotions because David is like sort of screaming and crying out that he doesn't want to be melted with acid. He knows that David is not a boy. He's not real. He doesn't have real emotions. He knows that it's just a mechanical uh, machine and um, that the so-called emotion that's being demonstrated is just utterly fake. It's just programmed fakery. He knows that and he tries to tell the audience. And there was a really good line. I think he says something like, do not be fooled by the artistry of its creation. Uh, no doubt there was talent that went into this simulator and, you know, he basically tells the, he's telling us the truth. He's talking to the audience and you get close up of him. He's also talking to us. I think that's Kubrick telling us, do not be fooled by fake intelligence. Do not be fooled by robotics, no matter how um, advanced they become in terms of sensory simulation. Never, ever be fooled into thinking that these things are living. They're just programmed mechanisms. Do not be fooled by the artistry of this creation. No doubt there was talent in the crafting of this simulator. You will see the big lie come apart before your very eyes. Don't burn me, don't burn me. I'm not Pinocchio, don't make me die. See how they try to imitate our emotions now. Whatever performance this sim puts on, remember we are only demolishing artificiality. That's all they are, there's no life to them at all. I think Kubrick was telling us that, but as is typically the case with Kubrick, and you know, he's talked about this in a lot of interviews, um, instead of shoving a, a particular concept down your throat, which is what most movies do, you know, most movies try to present a, a concept, an interpretation, and they try to make us have that interpretation and don't give us room to go and think something else. And those movies become incredibly boring because it's so obvious that the writer is trying to convince us convince us of a particular thing and that their attempt to convince us um, involves the blocking out of other options of opinion. And so Kubrick didn't typically take that approach. Um, instead of making the, 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 the point of the scene obvious, he would have the evidence there in the scene, he would have the thing communicated that he wants to say. Uh, he might have it on a very subtle level, he might have it on a, a more obvious level, but Typically, Kubrick would have his message, but he would also have um, alternative interpretations available to the viewer. And so, with, with this scene, the flash fair, we get told the truth about robots and AI. But the scene then has the crowd turn against the ringleader and attack him like he's cruel to the robot. And then the, the, the boy robot escapes because there's a riot. 
it's not very convincing that that happens for me. Um, I don't see why this whole crowd um, that would um, that would be all up for destroying artificial beings in order to maintain uh, their grasp on organic human reality. I don't see how that, how that crowd would suddenly change their mind just because um, a new robot um, gives a more dis convincing display of emotion. So th that feels very forced, but at least it gives us the option of um, rejecting the message. So for me, the message of the scene that I think what Kubrick meant was, uh, yes, robots are not real, they're artificial, uh, computer programs do not think, they don't feel, that it's all just mechanical fakery. Um, but at the same time, we're given that and we're not forced to accept that message. We're then given the alternate narrative and we can choose between the two. Uh, and the, the other one is the obvious narrative that, that you perceive on first viewing. So that's something I really like about that scene. Um, in fact, I remember there's a key line that occurs earlier um, when David is abandoned in the forest. Um, it's, it's a line that is very easy to miss. When um, the mother is abandoning the, the, the robot boy and um, she's trying to escape from him and he starts talking about Pinocchio turning into a real boy and she shouts at him, uh, stories aren't real as she runs away. Story tells what happens. Stories are not real. But it's said very quickly and it's easy to miss. And that's great, you know, stories aren't real. And that refers to the movie itself. Uh, the, 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 the surface narrative, the story of this movie, that robots have uh, feelings and thoughts and um, intelligence and emotions and therefore, you know, uh, the rights of a human. That is a story. It's a fable. It's a fairy tale. It's not real. And she's pretty much announcing that to us. Stories aren't real. Okay, folks, time for a commercial break here. For those of you who are not aware, over at my website, which is collativelearning.com, I've got a ton of videos and articles and audio files on film analysis and psychology and so on, which are available for digital download. And these are items that are mostly not available for free on YouTube or any other platform. You have to order the items one by one according to which ones you want to watch. Uh, and the items which are available to order are, are available on the film analysis page and here, which is the insight page. And that, that page, I'll just take you quickly to that. That page contains videos and articles and some audio files on psychology. There's a ton of psychology stuff there. Uh, there's stuff on video games. Uh, there's a couple of items on art, such as the HR Giga artwork. There's a huge study of his work on there. So say you wanted to make some orders and you were interested in the HR Giga one, you click view product and you have a little read up, you check out the price and if you like it, you say I want this and the item jumps up in there into the corner and you can stack items up there in the corner. Uh, let's say you went back to my previous page and you went to the film analysis page and say you wanted uh, the abyss, you click I want this and you can see that the, the items are stacking up there in the corner. So let me just take you through some of the other things we got. I've got a big video on the movie AI Artificial Intelligence, which, as most of you will know, is a Kubrick and Spielberg collaboration, massively underrated film. So I've got a 147-page analysis uh, of that film in PDF form, but it's got a whole bunch of supporting videos with it. I've uh, got lots of stuff on the Alien films, uh, militarism in the movies of Jim Cameron, two-hour video, stuff on the exorcist a two-hour video on eyes wide shut called the cult of eyes wide shut and in that one i explore all of the the various uh, conspiracy interpretations of eyes wide shut and i assess which ones have got merit and which haven't to give you my final conclusions on that let's see his uh full metal jackets you know tons of kubrick stuff here a huge study on uh, mad max 2 the road warrior nightmare on elm street two and a half hour analysis predator two hour 20 minute analysis uh, stuff on Pulp Fiction, Robocop, Risky Business, Saving Private Ryan, Scarface, lots of stuff on The Shining, Silence of the Lambs, Starship Troopers, tons of stuff here for you to sink your teeth into. So if you're ever, if you're ever bored with waiting around for me to post new content, because sometimes it takes me a few weeks between projects, then just have it over to the site and place a few orders. And once you've picked the items that you want uh, and they've stacked up in the corner there, you click pay. And you can select to use your credit card or PayPal 
It's all secure. I've been using this selling system for many years now, and there's never been a problem with people's personal data being breached or anything like that. And if there's ever a, a difficulty with the order, you can contact me very easily. There's a short video explaining how to place the orders and a little bit of uh, a write-up here about it as well. Okay, so if you're interested in that stuff, then head over to my website, which is collativelearning.com. And now back to the video. Another key line, um, one that is spoken by Gigolo Joe, the robot. And by, by the way, um, oh, what's the actor's name who was in that role? Um, Jude Law. He, he's really good. I mean, Jude Law has done some films that I really don't like, but when he's on form, he's great. And so when he's um, seducing the woman, uh, you know, he's basically a walking human vibrator, basically. <laughs> He says to her, um, he puts his fingers around her neck and he leans down and he looks in her eyes and he says, you wind me up inside. You wind me up inside. And he was talking about sexual excitement, but the way he describes it is it's a mechanical process. You wind me up inside. You know, like he's, um, <clears throat> like he's a walking uh, kid's toy that you're going you're gonna to wind up and then it's going to, go like a rabbit you know <laughs> uh yeah so nice little metaphor there one of the best scenes that really conveys um the artificiality of david it the robot who was not actually a boy the boy who never existed I'm, i was thinking about calling this video the boy who never existed well anyway um he goes with Gigolo Joe to, to um, Dr. No which is the um not Dr. No the James Bond character but Dr. No <clears throat> who is um you know, a sort of computerized internet search type um, uh, mechanism. And they try to find out where the real blue fairy is that is going to turn David into uh, a real boy. Of course, it's never ever going to happen. But because he's so stuck in his own program of wanting to be a real boy to please the mother, um, he is he is unable to let go. He would rather believe in something that is false, like blue fairy, uh, he 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 will do that because he's totally unable to break out of the mother love program, and when he and Gigolo Joe come out of that scene, and David has decided, you know, I'm 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 going to go to um, Manhattan to try and find the Blue Fairy, and it's a trick to get him there. It's a trick that's been set up by um, uh, the people who created him. When they get outside, <clears throat> Gigolo Joe the robot talks to David. And tells him, you know, tries to convince him that, hey, this blue fairy thing, it might just be a fantasy. It might not be real. And Gigolo Joe tells him outright that the mother figure that he seeks does not love him. Um, that he's just a toy that's been purpose built for that. She loves what you do for her. But she does not love you. You were designed and built specific like the rest of us. Uh, Gigolo Joe tells him the truth about uh, you know his status and the fakery of his love for the mother and even being faced with the harsh truth being presented to him by uh, Gigolo Joe and by that point Gigolo Joe has become a sort of a father figure to David and that's why you must stay here with me goodbye Joe and David should be happy I mean uh, Gigolo Joe actually says to him, uh, you know, forget this blue fairy fantasy and stay here with me. So he's got someone who cares for him, who will look after him, which is what any child should really want, a real child should want. And yet David cannot accept that. He couldn't accept the nanny robot when she offered to be um, the caring, loving mother figure. And he gets the same from Gigolo Joe regarding being a father figure. And yet David still can't accept it. Uh, because it is just a programmed mechanism and it, it cannot break out of this fake love for the mother that it's been programmed with. Uh, so that's a really good scene, that one. There's a good visual metaphor there as well. Um, th there's various points in the film where there's uh, the concept of programming loops, being stuck in a programming loop comes up. And um, when David and Joe are arguing about this, uh, they're stood in like a circular room and... Joe starts walking towards David and telling him the truth and it forces David to walk backwards on his program loop. So it's like he's trying to reverse the program loop. 
And then when David fights back and is like, no, no, I will find the blue fairy and she will turn me into a real boy and then mother will love me forever and all this. Um, when David starts saying that, he pushes back and continues to walk in that same circle that he was already walking in, stuck in the programming loop. One of the best examples in the film of uh, the, the robots trapped in a programming loop, uh, one of the best visual metaphors, is when David gets stuck in the, the bottom of the ocean at the end of the film, um, he finds a false blue fairy statue uh, which is submerged underwater. Most of Manhattan has been submerged underwater and he finds a Coney Island theme park and he finds the blue fairy statue and he's just pulls up to it in the water in his amphibicopter and he starts praying to it. And at that point, he can't do anything else. He is just stuck in that program and loop. And the great visual metaphor there is where a Ferris wheel falls down and traps the amphibicopter so that David can't get out. Uh, I don't think he can even open the, the, the copter if he wants to. And that's great because the Ferris wheel itself is something that goes round and round and round like a programming loop. Uh, and that's what David is stuck in. And this brings us to uh, a really in important interpretation of the ending. And this, I'm quite convinced of this. I think this is something that was intended. <clears throat> At the start of the movie, uh, the, the main guy who was the primary intellig human intelligence creator of the David robot, the professor, he talks to his board of executives and various planners and so on, all the people who, who work under him at his corporation. He talks to them about wanting to create a robot that can dream. An inner world of metaphor, of intuition, of self-motivated reasoning, of dreams. A robot that dreams. Yes. How exactly do we pull this off? <laughs> this is important. The ending of the movie, the way I see it, <clears throat> is that David gets trapped in the programming loop at the bottom of the ocean, continuously praying to this blue fairy artificial being. This uh, doesn't really exist. It's just a pure fantasy. Because he's stuck in the programming loop, that is the actual end of the uh, ending of the film. And then what comes after that is basically uh, the robot finally has what its inventor wanted it to have. It dreams. It has a dream. It has a wish fulfillment dream ending uh, involving uh, the mother's hair and the genetics um, bringing hair back to life and the entire ending of the movie pretty much reverses all of the misfortune that David had had throughout the film so David finally has as, as he is being gradually shut down uh, much like um, uh, HAL 9000 in um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, as Hal is being shut down in that film, he sort of reduces back to a very basic uh, computerized false intellect. <clears throat> as David is gradually shut down, because eventually he's going to have some power source in him that runs out. Uh, I mean, that, that's one question that is never answered in the movie is, where does David get his power? We humans, we eat, we breathe, we get our energy from that. We drink. Um but the robots in the movie seem to have endless power source, uh, which is ridiculous. And so David's trapped at the bottom of the ocean. Eventually, he would run out of power as he's stuck in this program loop. And as he's being um, shut down, as he's gradually shutting down, he finally has the equivalent of a dream. Uh, he has a robot dream. And in that dream, he ends up fulfilling his own so-called desire for mother's love. But even in that dream he is still operating on the mother love program. Okay, so like, how about if he had a dream where he was able to let go of the mother and not feel the, the undying programmed love, but he can't even do that in the dream state. Even in the so-called dream state, the robot equivalent of it, he is still stuck in that Ferris wheel robotic loop of um, wanting only the mother's love and nothing else. Uh, so he manages to have the dream but it's not a human type of dream. It's a robot dream, which just continues the program loop. So I think that's a really um, good take on the ending. And if you pay attention to everything that happens in the end, and it, it, all of that stuff is sort of, um, it reverses everything that happened to David early in the movie, but there's lots and lots of foreshadowing of it as well. Uh, for example, at the beginning of the movie, the, the real human boy, um, 
is in, who's in sort of, some sort of a coma. Uh, he is in a set which has a Ferris wheel type spiral ceiling, um, and it's all coloured in like blues and whites, and it's it's like a it's like a, an advancement, a, um, not an advancement. It's uh, a foreshadow of the ending, and I think it's also a clue that just as the boy who is in some sort of a coma is probably having various dreams while he's in that state, David himself is just stuck in the amphibicopter beneath the the programming loop Ferris wheel at the end, and he has a dream of this wish fulfillment ending. And there was one little thing about that ending as well, and I'd re- I really don't think uh, Kubrick would have been stupid enough to um, make this mistake, but the mistake seems to be there in the film anyway. And that is... When when the movie jumps ahead in time um, to a future where uh, the world is pretty much frozen over and Manhattan is frozen in ice, um, and that's you know the, the movie at the start of the movie it talks about global warming and the sea levels rising and stuff like that. But if you had massive global cooling that went the other way, where most of the o- oceans on Earth froze, I, mean, I don't really see that. Um, the oceans of Manhattan would freeze like the Arctic or Antarctic. I mean, I think you'd have to move the Earth away from the sun quite a distance to get that to happen. <clears throat> but I consider the freezing of Manhattan to be symbolic because um, in the same way that global warming causes the sea levels to rise because the ice caps melt more and it raises the sea levels, um, if you had global cooling, it would go the other way the ice at the caps, the polar regions, would increase and that would cause the ocean um, levels to go down. So if you did end up with frozen oceans like that, uh, it wouldn't be high up covering the buildings, it would be way down. Okay, so that's a, a big mistake in the ending. But like I said, I think the ending is a dream sequence anyway. And also I think the freezing of Manhattan um, is probably sort of a, a statement from Kubrick about The idea that one day in the future, uh, this corporate um, dog-eat-dog dominance of the world's financial markets by by Wall Street and the the, the surrounding uh, business area, that one day that stuff will come to an end and one day it'll just be a relic of the past. I think that's probably more what Kubrick was getting at uh, with that thing. Okay, so let's see. Before I finish up here, just see if there's anything else. Oh, yeah. Um... This is one, I've actually got a video out there on one of my other channels that you folks can go and watch on this aspect of it. The little character, Teddy, uh, is brilliant. He um, serves multiple purposes in the story. Uh, One thing is that um, in the same way that David is abandoned in the forest by his mother, at the end of the movie, um, Teddy has been absolutely devoted to David throughout the movie. Uh, because he was given to David as a gift by the family because they didn't want him anymore. And so Teddy sort of imprints on David and is determined to follow him and be loyal to him like a like a loyal dog. And at the end of the movie, um, when David um, cuddles up with the mother figure, there's a great irony in that final shot. Uh, you know, there's this... There's some uh, super mecha narration at, at the very end that says, oh, you know, David lived happily ever after in this this final moment with the mother and he finally went to sleep and didn't wake up and all that kind of stuff, this fantasy thing. And in the same shot, you see the Teddy uh, character crawl up on the bed and walk towards David and just sit down on the bed. And it's like, okay, so the mother abandoned David and now that he's got the mother figure, um, mother's love that he wants, he's going to shut himself down and now Teddy is left alone, uh, abandoned, just like he was. So... Yeah, David abandons Teddy just like Mother abandoned him. Uh, there's a lot of darkness to David in this movie. Uh, there's, de- there's definitely moments when he has um, aspects of it or its behavior that show that there's a dark side. Um, and actually, uh, that's one important thing about the movie as well. I mean, children do have a dark side. They can be very cruel. That's there in the film on, on multiple levels. Um Oh yeah, and it, well, well, I've got a video on that one on the Teddy character, and I'll I'll show it on screen, and you, and you can I'll, I'll, if I remember, I'll put the link in the video description. Uh, it's a good little breakdown of uh, the Teddy character, his role in the movie, so you can go and watch that one. Um, but another thing is, and I got this from the uh, the AI artificial intelligence um, 
storyboard book, which has been published, which I highly recommend you get that. Um, in that book, uh, there's a description of David having an Oedipus complex, which is a Freudian term to do with, um, you know, a boy's subconscious sexual attraction to the mother. Uh, the idea that as a boy develops his awareness of sexuality, um, and I suppose this happened with the girls with the fathers as well, as we grow up and we become aware of sexuality, the, the primary uh, imprinting that we have is with the parents, with the opposite sex parent, usually. Um, and it's almost like the opposite sex parent can become an archetype for us that we seek later in life. So you get that, that common... Uh, concept where you, you know you, you get the idea that there's um you know there's women who are looking for a father figure boyfriend or you get guys who are looking for a mother figure girlfriend and that's all to do with the freudian oedipus complex stuff and the oedipus complex has worked into the david character in the movie as well <clears throat> um, one of the big giveaways is at the start of the movie this is before he's even actually been programmed to love her he's thinks he's playing hide and seek with her she's on the toilet David opens the door, he looks in, he says, I found you, you know, he thinks it's hide and seek. And the mother, if you actually pause, freeze frame, uh, she's reading a book called Freud's Women, you know, so there's your reference to Freud and the Oedipus complex. Um, and then all the sexual stuff, that comes along later in the movie as well. It's like Gigolo Joe is like a reflection of David. It's almost like if David the robot, who'd been abandoned by his actual mother, by well, his actual mother, if David the robot had been abandoned by the mother that was supposed to love him but never did, and he's still seeking that love, if he was actually able to physically grow up in the way that an organic boy would, he would end up being, um, you know, Gigolo Joe. Uh, Gigolo Joe uh, goes round. Uh, using sexual prowess to woo women, to satisfy them, to make them love him. Um, you know, in the same way that the mother had imprinted on him, he grows up and then he goes around imprinting upon women and he does it emotionally and sexually. Um, <clears throat> and then you get the Rouge City uh, sequence, which is brilliant as well. Some of the best CGI special effects I've ever seen. I'm not a big fan of CGI, but it's done so well in this scene. If you pay attention to the whole Rouge City sequence, look carefully at the buildings, look at the signs, look at the various uh, um, symbols uh, that are outside of the um, the names of the, the, the buildings, you know, the names of the stores or whatever they're called. Um, look at, at all of that. It's massively pornographic. There are buildings that are literally the shape of naked women with the legs spread open, with big breasts, and people enter through the doorways, through like vaginal doorways and stuff like that. Uh, really pay attention to it, and you'll find that that whole sequence is full of sex metaphors. And I think part of the uh, the purpose of that is kind of like to it, it's it's saying to us, you know, it, it's talking about hedonism and um, sensory overload. Uh, you know, people who are incredibly materialistic and how we're all sort of conditioned by society to be obsessed with sex and sexual gratification and uh, uh, sexual stimulation um, as, a, as a great big distraction, almost like a drug. Uh, and Kubrick had this in The Clockwork Orange as well with uh, the, the mannequin table figures, um, those famous mannequin figures that were like naked women that people can lean their feet on and stuff like that. And people getting milk from dispensers that are that, that come from mannequins that are naked that are in subservient positions, and one of them's actually got its hands chained behind its back. I'm not going to show those on screen because uh, the nakedness of the the mannequins could get the video flagged and you know marked as uh, you know you have to sign in as an adult to watch the video. But yeah, watch the Rouge City sequence. Pay attention to all those visual details. There's tons of stuff going on there. Oh, one more thing. I want to go back for, to the flash fair sequence a moment. Um, when the crowd turns on the presenter, the presenter who tells them the truth about artificiality with the robots, um, a, a woman stands up and initially objects, and you can see she's emotionally distraught because she's heard uh, David uh, give his uh, simulation of a boy in emotional pain, and that triggers her... Um, organic organically programmed mother's love for children she stands up she looks tearful and she's like that's not a, a robot that's a real boy who is that don't burn me don't burn me i'm not pinocchio don't make me die I'm David. mecca don't plead for their lives who is that he looks like a boy 
built like a boy to disarm us. See how they try to imitate our emotions now. She she comes out with the line, she says, Mecha don't plead for their lives. Mecha is the term for robots in the movie. She says, Mecha don't plead for their lives. Who is that? And she's right. Mecha don't plead for their lives. They give a simulated act of it. Um, but there were already clues uh, before that uh, that the Mecha do um, give off a simulated pleading for their lives. I mean, David is in the forest with a bunch of other robots and they all run away from capture um, because they supposedly want to live. And you had one of the one of the robot characters is being shoved into a cannon. He's going to be fired out for the crowd's entertainment, uh, and he's sort of like trying to trying to joke and beg with the the people who are putting him into the cannon that he doesn't want to be fired into the, the, the shot into the fire because it'll destroy him. So when she says Mecha don't plead for their lives, that's nonsense because a lot of the robots in the movie have programs in which they imitate the desire to protect their own life. Uh, so that's a, a, a another funny little point in the film, but um, but yeah, she is acting upon her programmed mother's um, concern for a child, and she's fooled by the act that David puts on. And the guy says, "See how they try to simulate our emotions," and he is absolutely correct. Okay, um, actually, there's a few more things here. I'll, I'll try and reel these off quickly for things to look at. Um, the entire flesh fair sequence. It's not just about the stuff that I've described. Um, and it's not just about uh, the rights of robots in the future. The whole flesh fair sequence uh, is also an allegory for the cruelty of humans throughout history. Um, it's, it seems to reenact uh, the Roman Colosseum stuff where, you know, they, they would take people, take slaves and make them fight lions and get eaten alive for the entertainment of the crowd. Um, the brutality of humans throughout history to each other, which has uh, occurred sometimes racially, um, and has sometimes occurred towards other groups, not necessarily ra racial, but there can be others, you know, certain religious groups persecuted and so on. Um, or, you know, uh, re religious groups can be persecuted by people who are atheists and so on. Well, anyway, all of that stuff, the cruelty of human beings throughout history, that's a part of the movie as well. And it's, um, it's done as a metaphor about the robots. So on the one hand, the movie is telling us that, yeah, yeah you know, robots... Computer programs, not real, just artificial, total fakery. But at the same time, the movie presents an allegory of how cruel humans can be. So you, you get robots that are being literally torn apart, um, melted and stuff in front of the crowd for entertainment. Um, and if that was done with actual human beings, it would be incredibly gory and sadistic. Um, but by presenting it with the destruction of robots, it's a way of showing the audience in a fr family-friendly format how cruel and brutal humanity can be. So that's a great aspect of the film. In the same way that the robots in the movie become stuck in program loops, well, th that's all they can do. They can only run program loops. We humans can get stuck in program loops as well. And, you know, there's examples of this in the movie. Um, the, the David's preoccupation with the blue fairy and the fantasy of... Um, uh, trying to find eternal mother's love. Um, I think part of that is, is kind of a maybe a comment on the human condition where we have a tendency to live in denial of things and to pursue fantasies that are not realistic and so on. Yeah, I think that's part of the movie. I'm not going to go deep into that, but I think it's definitely there. Okay, so, yeah, I think... Uh, let me just double-check this last page. Was there anything else I wanted to say on it? Yeah, well, I, I suppose one thing is that I think... Um, <laughs> this is a, an ironic thing. When people say they find the ending of the movie too soppy, too sentimental, there's an ironic truth in that. People are right about that. It is soppy. It is sentimental. But it's meant to be. It, it, it's not doing that to try and fool us into, being, um, into believing in the, the soppy ending. The movie is demonstrating us uh, the fakery, uh, the, the, the pursuit of wish fulfillment. Um, and how ridiculous it can be, and it's also talking about how how we can become in uh, we can become stuck in program loops ourselves, where we you know we, we might worship a god that doesn't exist, uh, you know we might pursue some dream of transformation of ourselves that can never happen. You know you get people who people who think that they can use um, I don't know like, like lots and lots of makeup and plastic surgery to try and turn themselves into having movie star looks but that they're never actually going to have and things like that. There's lots and lots of um, uh, 
artificial fantasies that we humans pursue in life and we get stuck in program loops pursuing that stuff so i think that's a major uh, part of the movie and i also think um perhaps the movie ai was made a bit too early uh, maybe if it had made, been made now it would be more relevant in terms of in terms of its robot themes because we're getting all of this media coverage these days it's talking about uh, oh look at the latest chatbot is so convincing you know uh, uh, machines are finally starting to think or some crap like that you know and, it, and I, I hear all these people talking about oh chat box are getting so clever they're not clever they're just program loops that's all they are it's the people who program them who are clever um and i think as time goes on and these computer programs and and um the physical um robots become more advanced and uh, getting a little bit closer all the time to being a, a convincing representation of a human i think as that goes on the movie AI is going to become more and more and more relevant. Um, and there may come a time where humanity is sort of at war with itself about whether robots should be treated as equivalent to human. That time may come. And if it does come, this movie AI is going to be so relevant and I think it will become um, a lot more discussed. Okay, so there you go. This is a quite a quite a rambling video I've done here, uh, all over the place, bouncing back and forth. Um, but it's been a while since I put a video out, so I wanted to get this out quickly. Um, I was going to record a second video today um, on Lolita, but it doesn't look like I'm going to have time to do it. I'm going to pick my daughter up from school shortly. Um, so I'll try and get the Lolita video recorded um, in the next few days if I can. Uh, in the meantime, I will get this one out, and I hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, if you want more material, in the meantime, head to my website, collativelearning.com. There's tons and tons of videos and articles there. Um, some of them are for free, um, and the links are all on there, and there's lots and lots of sale items on there. There is actually a very detailed, long study of the movie AI that goes into way more detail than I've talked about here. It's primarily in a PDF format, but it's got about four videos, complementary videos that come with it. Um, I think that the whole um, analysis is well over 100 pages long, uh, the PDF version, and there's about four or five chapters out of that that have been um, sort of done in video format as well. So that stuff is available on my site as a package if you want to get the download of that. Um, the links to follow my work on Facebook and Twitter are also in the video description below, and there's a link to my Patreon. Um, sign up to me on Patreon, you can get access to some more material, uh, including the David Lynch, Stanley Kubrick uh, video that I did a while ago. Called, it was called The Dreams of Lynch and Kubrick. I think that's what it was called. That's a, a Patreon exclusive video. Um, so if you want access to that one, follow the link in the video description, sign up to me on Patreon. As a monthly supporter, you'll get access to that video and quite a few more. Okay, thanks for watching, folks. Take it easy. Bye-bye.